Good evening, and thank you for tuning in to From the Desk of Precious Swain. Tonight, we'll be talking to Pamela Troutman. We're going to talk about human trafficking, domestic violence, and what happens when the victim fights back. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having this platform, because this is a discussion that all women should be having from all walks of life, because this could save a life. It could give women the courage to step up and step out. I hope women are able to take a lot from this conversation. First, for those in the audience that don't know who you are, introduce yourself. I am the female Howard Stern of radio. And I got that name because my radio show, Chocolate City Radio, was an adult radio show. I took on topics that were very out there. I possibly did some things that Howard hasn't done on his show before. Let's just say that it is a name that I well deserved. Um, I gave the artists a platform to have interaction with their fans, not be ruled by FCC. We could cuss, we could do whatever, and I do mean whatever, on the show. But then we also had serious shows reflecting issues that was going on in the world like Trayvon Martin, domestic violence, cancer awareness, things like that. So I don't want you to think, you know, you guys would think that it was just all fun. I started that in 2010. I started modeling at the age of 40 when most people told me that I was too old to do the things that I wanted to do. 10 years later, I'm still relevant. I'm still popping. And I have other women stepping out and doing what it is they want to do, regardless of what people are in their ear saying. I kind of feel good about, you know, being a role model for women to not just settle and just do whatever it is they want to do. Tell us kind of from the beginning, how in the world your daughter ended up in a human trafficking situation as a full adult with kids. I am a survivor of domestic violence. When I was 18, my boyfriend, that was the first time I ever got hit. I grew up watching my parents fight, my dad jumping on my mom, rest her soul. I knew the things that I didn't want to go through, but for some reason, I ended up being in them anyway. And the last abusive relationship I was in, it was a short-lived relationship. I was beat up four times, cut and stabbed. A restraining order didn't help me. If anything, it made it worse and the system failed me. With me going through that and then being married and going through an, a situation and then having another abusive situation, I only have one daughter and I never ever wanted my daughter to go through that. She ended up going through that anyway. She started out in her first domestic violence relationship when she was 15. Anybody that knows my daughter, she'll tell you, I'm not an abused woman. I'm the one that starts the fights. That's what people want you to think. Anytime that a man or a woman is verbally, emotionally, spiritually abusive to their mate, it's abuse. She was in that relationship for five years. Then she got out that relationship and got into another abusive relationship. And she was in that one for like two years. So basically from age 15 to 26, I want to say, she was in abusive relationships. But in her eyes, she didn't see herself as an abusive woman because she could fight back. That's how most men want women to think. Like, oh, just because you swung, you ain't no damn victim. That's far from the truth. Alicia was good about not telling me people who she was talking to because what comes up comes out. I have no filter regardless of what it is. She didn't tell me about him till later on. I guess she had her reasons because when he was older, you know, she didn't want me to be like, oh my God, you're dating an ugly ass man. You know, it's a serious situation, but I always find humor in a lot of things. So when she told me that they were dating and I'm like, what? 
She was like, Mommy, I am so happy in my life. He treats me so good. He takes care of the boys. And she's like, I'm helping him with his boys because he worked a lot. And, you know, they had a situation that worked while they were here. And, you know, he decided that um, he wanted to go back to Grand Rapids and work. So he applied for a position and he got transferred. And he told her that it would be a good idea for her to come with him because he always kept saying that he wanted to marry her one day. He wanted to adopt her kids and things like that because they looked up to him as a father figure. Their dads couldn't come around because they didn't know how to keep their hands to themselves. And it was just always an ugly situation we talked about it and i'm just like you know i left home when i was 21 i got married and he was in the military so we moved around and i'm like baby it's not gonna be easy because you used to being around your mom all the time but i'm just a phone call away anything happens you know call me he met the family he met her brothers he met her uncle which is my brother and everybody felt like you know he was a good mate for her the night before they leave, she comes by the house and I'm just like, Marcus, I'm trusting my daughter to you. Ever put your hands on my daughter, I will fuck you up. And he's like, no, I could never hurt her. I love her. I want her to be my wife. And they get to Michigan. Alicia gets a job. Marcus was wanting her to be solely dependent on him. So he took his time about helping her get an ID and things like that. When she got paid, he would take her check and deposit it into his account and give her $100. That's because my daughter was bad at spending. She could take her whole check and go buy stuff for the household, stuff for everybody in there, and spend all her money and not have any. You know, during the trial, they took it to me like, oh, she would probably buy some weed or she buy some wine. But no, that's not what she meant. It's just that my daughter has a caring heart and she comes last and everybody else comes first. It got to the point where things were starting to get weird in her relationship. What I didn't know is that Marcus had this deep sexual side. Um, I found this out when she got arrested and one of the detectives asked me that she tell me about their sex life. And I'm like, what kind of shit is this? Like, no. That's when he went on to tell me that there was an incident prior to the one that had happened on the 9th. When it came to sexual things, he wanted her to do things that she wasn't comfortable with. So, you know, I guess it's most men's fantasy to have a threesome. And sometimes it's a lady's fantasy, just depends on who's putting it in your ear. Being that she was a pleaser, she gave him that with her friend. It didn't turn out very well, and that's because when they got ready to have the threesome, he couldn't get hard. So he was very upset about that. He had another idea. Why don't you sleep with other men and I watch from the closet? She's like, hell no, I'm not with that. She's like, it, it, you know what? Give me money. Give me my money that you've been saving for me because I want to go back home to my mama. He didn't want that to happen. He tried to use some reverse psychology. You know, things was just like, you know, breaking down. You know how in relationships when things are, you know, when it's on its last leg, he came home and told her that he didn't want her anymore. And he was going to see other people. That was fine because my daughter already had a contingency plan that she was going to go to Michigan. If things didn't work out, she was going to school in North Carolina. They helped you get cars and things like that. So she had her act together on what she wanted to do. He heard her on the phone with somebody. He got jealous. I guess he thought he was going to break her down by saying he didn't want to be with her anymore. And she's just like, oh, well, you know, I'm going out. But she didn't want She still was being respectful because they stayed in the same house. So she told the person to meet around the corner. After he eavesdropped on the conversation, he wanted her phone. So then they started tussling over the phone. Then Alicia is 5'3", between 135 and 140. And he was 6'2", 245 pounds. 
No, he wasn't beating her in her face, but he was grabbing her and throwing her into the walls and slamming her on the floor. So he was still abusing her, even though he didn't physically punch her in the face. She got to the point where she was able to get free. She could be heard screaming, crying, saying, I just want to go home to my mama. Please let me go. She ran downstairs. She grabbed the knife out of the dish rack, whether it was in the dishwasher or the kitchen. But she removed herself from the situation. Um, she didn't have a coat or anything. She lived in a middle class Jewish neighborhood. So when the son called the 911 the first time and was like his parents was arguing, they didn't seem like it was life threatening because of the area that they lived in. So they didn't roll out a car that first call. She ran outside and she was on the steps between their house and the neighbor's house. He was over her and she thought that he was going to push her because he had just finished slinging her in the walls and floors. So who, why wouldn't you think that this man was going to push you down the steps? So she told him she had a knife and she didn't want to hurt him and to back the fuck up. He did totally opposite. He was just like, bitch, you got a knife. He lunged at her. It was able to penetrate all that. And he was on a two steps higher than her. She called 911 and told them that she had stabbed him and that they had been fighting. Turned into a nightmare because imagine at three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning, you're asleep. Your daughter calls you crying, saying, and it's a call from jail. And you're like, what the hell? She tells you her boyfriend is dead. She killed him. She has two boy, little boys that were two and three at the time. It's like, okay, where are the boys at? I didn't need them to go into the system. I found them, tried to get to them. Michigan was so hell bent on putting them in the system. Because it's like when you have family members that want to get your children. Kids are still in foster care. I didn't have the money to pay for the lawyer that she needed. We went with a court a perm appointed attorney. I just feel like he was one of those that eventually ended up selling her out for something else down the road. She finally got her trial date, which was March 18th. I called her lawyer plenty of times because I was like, her friends wanted to write statements, you know, character letters and things like that. What does she need to wear to court to be presentable? Things like that, like um, giving him names of witnesses that could be a character witness to say, you know, like the boyfriend had a temper because um, his ex-wife, he beat her so bad that he got put on probation and she dropped their kids off to him like 11 12 years ago and never looked back but you know i guess because you're ex-military you know they take pride in like oh he was a good guy kept calling the lawyer i emailed him he wasn't responding back left a message on his voicemail like hey this is her mom. We need to talk defense. You know, do I need to take third chair? How about I come to Michigan? I just hold you and your crippled ass assistant in your office until we can come up with a plan. So I guess that must have scared him because he didn't tell you none of my calls. None. I, I, he wasn't talking to me before then. He really wasn't talking to me. She had got offered a plea. A lesser charge of um, involuntary manslaughter with a plea bargain two to four years. Lawyer tells her no, because the district attorney that he's going up against, he had went up against him in the past 11 times and he beat him every time. What the hell they got to do with this? You told her not to take that plea bargain. Told her that y'all was gonna win trial. When I came to court that Wednesday for closing arguments, the district attorney didn't know that I was her mom because he's never seen me before. And he told me she was going to be found guilty. And I looked at the foster mom and I'm like, wait a minute, right then and there, 
something didn't sit right with me. He got mad that the family didn't come back from lunch on time. And I'm like, why is he acting like this? What I felt a little odd was doing the closing arguments. The judge was very compassionate. And when he was given the, the, um, the deliberation instructions, he was like, self-defense and you know you can do a lesser charge and the district attorney stood up and interrupt the judge while he was giving the instructions the jury got the case the victim's mother father brother and his two sons was there and it could have been their mom um i'm not really sure he tells them to meet him in the courtroom. You know, me and Crystal, we go downstairs. That's the foster mom. We go downstairs and we're in the cafe and we see the people that were sitting with the family walking around with a young boy downtown. And then an hour and 45 minutes later, the jury came back with a verdict. When we came in the courtroom, it was filled with sheriff deputies. But wasn't anybody in there except for me, Crystal, and a couple of lawyers. His family was nowhere to be found. Your family was coming to court every day of the trial. Why wouldn't they be there for the biggest moment of the trial, which is the verdict? But I was just so hurt because you consider my daughter to be this cold and calculus murderer. And I was just like, you know what? I hope you choke and die in your sleep. That was the nicest thing that I could say aside from catching a terroristic threat charge or anything like that. I was numb. What in the hell just happened here? Even the judge was like surprised at the verdict. He had this look like, what the fuck? something more to it after she was found guilty i'm like okay we gotta work on this appeal i started talking to other lawyers and everybody was like that was a slam dunk case she was supposed to walk and even jail is like there are some people you know that they're in there for something that they didn't do or they was justified in doing and that was alicia that changed my outlook on the system that changed my outlook on women getting a fair shake on getting their ass whooped it just showed me that no matter how much everybody is like women equality rights women's rights we have the right to take whatever punishment a man feels like he wants to impose on us. Seeing what went on with you, seeing what went on with Alicia, interacting with the law now in two different states in regards to this, what would your recommendation or your advice be to someone that is currently a victim? Reach out to any organization that deals with battered women. Don't be afraid to admit that you've been raped, abused, whether it was physical, mental, or emotionally. Speak up because your truth may save you and it may save somebody else. Women, we have to stand up, stand for something, and fight for it all. In today's episode, we heard firsthand a true, very real story of a woman who suffered domestic violence, whose daughter suffered domestic violence, and the end result ended up in someone being dead. If you are in a situation where you are being abused, make a plan and get away. Don't wait until the coroner has to come. Domestic violence comes in several forms, financial, verbal, emotional, physical, and mental. People will try to pull your puppet strings. And for those that are fighters, because that was me, I felt like I wasn't a victim because I would fight. We're victims too, because no one should hit. Thank you all for tuning in. 
today we talked about forgiveness. We talked about forgiveness from a very painful place. But our guest was able to come back. That is truly a blessing for anyone to be able to grow in that fashion. Now let's take a look at what scripture has to say about this topic. Coming to you guys today from the Safar. You can definitely follow along in your King James Version. And we're reading Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 and 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as Elohim for Masiach's sake has forgiven you. And what's deep about it is that no matter what the situation, we need to forgive. When the Messiah went on the cross, he took on the sins of the world. He didn't just take on the ones he liked. He didn't just take on white sins or black sins, male sins or female sins. He took on all of the sins that we may be forgiven for our imperfection. Yes, our imperfection, because none of us are perfect. Even though we may all have a calling, even though we may preach, teach, even though we may wear a robe and a collar, we're still not perfect. Our righteousness is like filthy rags before him. So remember, no matter what it was, if you live through it, learn from it, but forgive. Thank you again for tuning in to the Desk of Precious Mind.